Okay, I just wanted to make a few, a few comments and thank you for such interesting uh, presentations. Um, the thing that really strikes me, I guess, first of all, is that um, I'm, I'm trying to think of how what you've just said puts into relief what was said at the other panel, right? So the first thing that strikes me is the issue of temporality, and I think that's Nathaniel's in particular, just the idea of intergenerational ethic, that, um, that we can't think of invasives in the language of emergency or crisis uh, of a particular kind of temporal moment, right, that we need to think of it, but it has to be a very different kind of temporal crisis, that an invasion has a very different temporal reality, right, across histories and generations, and uh, if we think of nuclear, you know, uh, that kind of a threat as well, that's, that's you know, hundreds and thousands and hundreds of years. Um, and I'm gonna just refer to David's other work, which he didn't talk to, about here, but is the relationship between self and other that's helped to challenge theories of immunology, actually, which also gives us a very different temporality that kind of, that the immune system has developed over, you know, incredibly long periods of time. So I just think that how does this kind of make us think of invasion and invasive others differently in terms of, um, we think in, in, in terms of very different time frames, right? The second one is, is distance, which I think Vin Kim has also brought, brought up, um, that how close or how far does an invasive other have to be to be infected, you know, in some ways, right? Um, what's the infecting agent, you know? Can it be in you, <laughs> right, already, and then um, and suddenly become uh, invasive in some particular way, as a cancer, of course, can be. Um, but I think that we need to be attentive to distance, and even if we think of immigrants, how far uh, away do, do migrants need to be when, and, and be considered okay, right? We're happy being, uh, having humanitarian um, interventions in places you know, that, that touch distant others, but how far does that distance need to be when we're still generous and compassionate and benevolent, right? Um, and the third uh, thing I think is, is back to what Radhika asked earlier, which is the perception of that invasive other, which is you know when you can't see it, how do you how do you address it? And I think again, um, I was thinking about that with um, with your your uh, presentation, Vin Kim, when, um, that on the one hand we think okay. It can't be witchcraft because there's two, there's, it doesn't follow the right pattern. But on the other hand, if we don't see the bodies, you know, we don't see what caused them. Then w what is the invasive? What's the problem here? So I think you know, by by bringing in the issue of disease um, and pathogens, we we kind of I think it allows us to think across. Um, uh, it brings in those things to the conversation uh, about people as well. I think that are very important. And I just uh, had a question maybe to each of you, and then I, you know, you can answer or kind of ask each other questions, but um, I guess my question to David is, uh, because I know your work, uh, your other work, is that you got to the side of, of, of being, of thinking about otherness and difference and, and, and kind of urging us to be curious about the other and, and interested in difference, um, but you didn't speak about it necessarily in relation to epidemics or in relation to your own work on immunology, and I wondered if you could speak and bring those together because I think David has done very interesting work on, again, how a modeling of, of um, of self and other has actually changed, or our, we should think immuno, immunological models have changed our understandings of the boundaries between self and other. I mean, I guess it goes back and forth, how, how we think about that. So this is, again, taking it beyond metaphor to think about how different models actually really change our perception of what difference is and where it begins and where it ends. So I wanted you to speak maybe a bit about that. Um, Nathaniel, um, I think it's super interesting to think about the connectedness of all of this and how mosquitoes thrive in the certain kinds of trash that we produce in, in very privileged areas. Um, and I, so I wondered if you could speak m more about, um, about this notion of eco-health, you know, uh, because it's, the idea is that, you know, we bring everything together into one larger ecosystem that's, you know, that, and think about health in those terms, and I wonder, if that's a way to, to, to challenge the invasive language in some sense, um, or what you think about that kind of a concept. Um, and to Vin Kim, I, I think you know, the similarities obviously, and I think you've noticed this, between uh, isolation uh, camps and, uh, and detention centers are interesting, and I wondered if you could speak a little bit more, since you've worked with refugees, about the logics of these camps and centers and how one plays on the other or not, right? Um, 
um, I mean, I, I'm struck, of course, by the fact that those who are put in detention centers or camps or container camps and treated like goods are seen as entirely unval you know, have no value whatsoever, mm -hmm. whereas the folks in these isolation camps actually somehow garner a very particular kind of value. Um, so maybe if you can speak a little bit to, to that. <laughs> and you don't need to address that. You can also speak to each other. Let's follow protocol. Oh. <laughs> All right, I'll go, um, I'll go up to bat first. Uh, Miriam, thanks very much. I, um, I very much like the way you, um, you uh, characterized your three domains, uh, perceptions of invasive other, uh, issues of distance and uh, issues of, of temporality. Um, what uh, Miriam is referring to, uh, the work that I did talk about, um, has to do with um, actually spending um, a couple of decades um, uh, not only uh, talking to patients and clinicians, but also working with uh, theoretical immunologists around their views of what immunology actually uh, consists in. And of course, for most people, um, our immune system is only and principally a defense mechanism. It's what protects us from that radical other, and in fact, uh, it's commonly understood not only by um, you and me, but also by people who do research in this area as a mechanism for recognizing and eliminating non-self, however that is defined. Now, this model uh, is one that emerges very profoundly, interestingly enough, uh, during the Cold War era. In fact, you have no evidence for any discussion about the immune system uh, before the late 60s, which um, historian of immunology, Emery Moulin, has written about um, extensively. I mean, immunity, yes, but not this idea, to get back to the comment about the invisible, nefarious uh, armies at war within the self, um, not in that way until the late, uh, the late 1960s and during the, uh, principally during the Cold War era. So there's a lot that could be said about that, but what I want to do is, is actually address Miriam's uh, comment about, um, about why uh, this model persists. I can't say that I have uh, all the answers for that, but I can say that, that it has persisted even though um, uh, many immunologists have found it very unsatisfactory. <clears throat> and there are some concrete reasons for this. One of them is the fact that when we talk about, for example, the uh, AIDS virus or another virus that infects us, in fact, viruses have no motility. They're not alive, they're just information. And to get to your point about the complexities of climate change, they can sit in the polar ice cap for you know, tens of thousands of years, and um, and that information can can reemerge in unexpected ways, and um, it can cling to man-made objects as well as um, as well as uh, natural habitats. And so, and so the question of what it is we're doing when we when we say that our immune system protects us is really a against viruses and the viruses that attack us, the, the, that all little children learn about in school about how to prevent um, being, uh, being affected by viruses. It's actually a language that evolves out of microbiology where real organisms actually do nasty things to us, unlike viruses, which we do nasty things to one another because we have that information, if you see what I'm getting at. And, um, uh, I want to say a few things about the distancing and the temporality, but if I could just push this a little bit further. So, so what, what, what happened over a long period of time was there's a resistance to the idea that, that, that immunology was really about self and non-self, and th there were problems with that model. First of all, in what way is, uh, is that information non-self? Well, if you don't have, if you don't have locking me mechanisms on cell service receptors, you can't have binding. So genuine non-self doesn't actually attach to a cell, which leads some evolutionary biologists to think uh, that this pathological information actually evolves out of normal cell genes, which is why today we have regenerative medicine and viral vectors, which convey information via cells to regenerate a healthier response to a potentially damaging bit of information. All of which is to say 
that there's some strong arguments for uh, uh, suggesting that your immune system is actually more of a search engine of difference than it is a defense mechanism. And the evidence for that is in uh, the, the fact that our bodies produce an almost infinite number of B, uh, bone marrow, and T, thymus cells, which are actually mutants, okay? These are, this, our body produces massive diversity as a way of engaging its environment for better or worse. Now, this doesn't resonate well with uh, people who believe that the fittest survive and that actually uh, only those who are strong survive risk. This is, this is a very, uh, actually a grimmer view of our relationship to our environment, but one that really does, I think, um, uh, um, emphasize the symbiotic nature of, uh, to get to the time issue, uh, the symbiotic nature of, uh, of how information over time um, generates certain kinds of uh, responses that are largely mediated by social factors. And I loved, um, uh, Vin Kim, your, 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 your suggestion about um, uh, the, the, the fact that the, 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 the distancing created by actually putting people together and, and we all know that the most lethal viral information actually uh, is very fragile, and, and that when we bring that together, we actually can uh, can generate as well as um, uh, as well as control uh, its its after effects. So uh, there's a, a lot more that could could be said ab said about that, but um, I think that I'll stop there because otherwise I would talk just indefinitely. <laughs> Thanks. So I'll just make my comments brief. Um, I, I mentioned that there's a general dearth of theoretical underpinning for public health. I mean, it's obvious. You know, you go out and you do good and you cure kids of viral illness and you prevent diarrhea. A lot of it is like that, but um, a lot of the, the classic theoretical underpinning emerges from writers like Verkow, who worked during the height of the Prussian imperial uh, period in, in Germany, uh, during which a tremendous amount of um, the worldview, uh, the dominant worldview at the time, was incredibly static. I mean, this is the, the era, essentially, that, that produced trench warfare, and you can see all those metaphors uh, regenerating in the way that, uh, that we spoke about illness and disease uh, from the, the <laughs> late 1800s through the mid-1900s. Um, I do think that given the pace of change uh, in um, the interactions between humans and the environment, of which Zika is, a, I think, going to be uh, a harbinger slash classic example, um, that the time is ripe for us to try to assist those who have the ability to throw $4 billion, $5 billion at a problem um, it, much of it, again, I'm not speaking for the federal government, much of it um, wasted. <laughs> you know, I think that the total number of individuals who were treated in the something on the order of 800 to 1,000 beds that were created by the U.S. Army in West Africa um, amounted to 25 people. I mean, these, this is the number that was public, so I, I'm sure that those of you on the ground have different numbers. But, you know, when we think about what we are doing in public health, and the, the chronic lack of funding, the chronic cries for um, prioritization compared to the massive ways in which our current course of actions, uh, especially in, in rich nations, uh, and the, the aspirations of less rich nations to repeat what the rich nations are doing, um, uh, you know, these are things that are going to drive us into the ground in terms of the interaction between humans and the rest of the living world and maybe even, I don't know if you can call viruses dead, but the dead world <laughs> uh, in, in ways that will wind up causing hum more human misery and suffering. Um, I, you know, I, it is strange that in the last 10 years, everyone seems to be interested in worlds in which zombies roam freely on the streets, but uh, they might be onto something. Not in terms of the zombies, but in terms of a, a, a grimmer future. You know, we, Malthus 
was on to one aspect of this. Of course, he got it wrong in terms of food production now that we have genetically modified organisms. But that's causing its own problem. And we're going to wind up bouncing around in a limited box with uh, many people, a lot of trash, and unexpected consequences. And we need a way to see clearly through this so that we can redirect our resources so that they're more effective. I actually th th wanted to, to follow on to that because I think uh, what is clear to me from these two panels is that there's, uh, uh, at one level, there is this kind of, and we were talking about this earlier, the metaphoric construction of otherness, right? It's a powerful metaphor and it works in many places, it makes us, it helps us to understand or feel that we understand lots of things like the war on cancer or uh, how we fight an, inf fight an infection, et cetera, et cetera. And so the, 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 con the paradox that we have these very, this very powerful tool, which is metaphor, shall we say, or a certain kind of symbolic or cultural logic, which is confronted with increasing complexity, right? Like so, so what you were showing the 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 the, the um, EDs and and plastic, and I didn't go into the whole discussion around Ebola. That's something I'd love to talk to you about about why it spread the way it did. Um, but it's it's even more com it's not it's not only like it's more complicated than simple concepts and a complicated reality because. Um, what we are actually doing also produces concepts and produces realities, right? So your search engine example was, was great because I, I was just thinking, wow, that's a great way to understand how the immune system works. And we have that understanding because we, we built search engines and we know how they work. And I think, I'm, and so I'm, this is a very long-winded answer to your question, uh, Miriam. <laughs> Don't lose patience. Uh, but it actually answers, it actually contests what you said, which is we've wasted all this money. Uh, first of all, a little parenthesis, I, it is amazing how bleep much money the US government has. It is just unbelievable compared to these scrawny little countries like France or Canada. I mean, the US can literally come in and say, I'd like a hospital over there, please. And then two months later, it's built. And then, and then they'll, somebody will come back from Washington and say, could you move it a bit to the left? And then, you know, two weeks later, they move it to the left. Literally. I mean, I've, uh, and, and you know that a lot of this stuff is being done by defense subcontract. Anyway, there's a whole story there. <laughs> but this money is, is, is productive because it's, a, it's all a dress rehearsal for something. Uh, I think that, and this is what, you know, Veronica taught me from her experience being interned in the French military camp. Like, the technology in there was unbelievable. And we all know that biomedical innovation is driven by war, real war, not metaphoric war, where we developed, you know, ventilators, we developed all those things that we invented, skin grafts, immunology, you know. Uh, so I think there's a, there's a broader, so this, it, there is, a, I'm not trying to be functionalist, but I think you, you know, th this money is there, might as well use it and learn something from it. And that's where it comes to this the isolation detention thing. There's a lot that's been learned, I think, about how people move and how to control, that makes it sound too instrumentalist, but how to address problems of, of movement. Um, I wanted to say just something very quickly about what we've seen around, uh, to, to come back to this question of otherness and invasion. I think these metaphors of invasion and other don't work. That's what I want to argue, because the phenomena we're talking about have to do with connectivity. Right, and with sameness, right, right, and that's what uh, I thought of that because of what you said, right, the, the self, non-self. So, somebody who's the same as someone else can't, you know, in a God metaphoric level. When you're the same, you can't be touched by another, right? So the the thing that move it's it's movement that produces otherness and that produces the possibility of infection, not only lit not only materially in the real world but perhaps also symbolically. I don't know. Great. Uh, we want to open the floor to questions. Um, we would start with Jean at the back. Um, uh, I just want to come right back to where you, you ended because the metaphors don't work for us analytically, but we still use them and certainly people in context use them. Mm 
Yeah. And it's, in some senses, isn't there a connection between the very complexity, the multidimensionality of all of this, um, the degree to which, as you say, the intervention was based on a prediction that was wrong to start with. It had its own sense of temporality. What was existing on the ground had another sense of temporality. The two things exist in symbiosis in a kind of negative di dialectic that produce yet something else. And all along the way, their efforts to impose some kind of simplification on a spiraling complexity for which neither we nor the people mm. themselves have the models, right? Mm. So the question of the kind of temporality that gets imposed on it and why the, the kind of constant appeal of the kind of neo-colonial or eugenic metaphors is precisely because, in a way, they seem to impose some kind of, not only order, but some kind of mode, which an order which has within it a kind of directive to practice. And I think that the difficulty there, it's an old anthropological point, but it's kind of models all the way down, and, mm -hmm. and not to confuse the unintended effects of what's going on. So that, for instance, the, the, the witchcraft works up to a point until the reality on the ground makes it clear that it can't be the logic of witchcraft, because witchcraft's about exception yeah, and particular kind of causal relations. And then one moves to something else. But the question for me is that, you know, first of all, that, that, that there's such extraordinary complexity and that we see through a glass darkly when we begin to work with immunological models. I mean, the whole business of autoimmunity, for instance, you know, and what that might mean to all of this. But, but nevertheless, the metaphors are there, and they come back as modes, and like the temporality that imposes a kind of simple linear line or two lines it, at something which, on something which actually is multiply temporal and dialectical all along, which gets to the question of, A, can we really be simply rational about the fact that we shouldn't have spent the money and we could have done something better? Because we only know that in retrospect, right, in, in some senses. And B, the question is, what actually is being generated here? And it seemed to me that where you ended, Vin Kim, by this question, why do these people matter so much? But you kind of answered the question yourself in many ways. Yeah. At one level, there's a kind of neo-military, you know, sort of anticipatory logic. Another level, there's the whole question of the production of the image of control. <coughs> yeah. uh, uh, that, that in fact, yeah. there is a way in which we can act upon this reality, and it's it's a micro, it's a metonym or a microcosm of other things. And then there's the production of virtue, and there's the production of you know competitive. Uh, uh, abilities to kind of mobilize science and knowledge. So all of those things seem to come into it. Can, can I comment on that? Mm -hmm. um, I, I really appreciate your wrapping that all into a very cogent paragraph. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but let me add one other interesting facet. Um, so I, I had the privilege, opportunity, happenstance of being um, in the group in Washington that was responsible for many of these m modeling results and also connected with the group at CDC who famously published this 1.3 million, uh, 1.1 to 1.3 million figure. Um, neither of those numbers or efforts were the thing that led to the boots on the ground. That was a totally different, although related, metaphor, yep. which was that it was elevated on the basis of, especially the CDC modeling number, to an issue of national security. So, so this is very interesting. So it, so the, so it played no role? Those it models? played a role to set the stage for further discussions among the national security staff mm. about how that number would pose a threat to national security. Yes. And once it went into the realm of a national security issue, My new key informant. <laughs> <laughs> um, it, it, it assumed a, complete, a completely different life of its own within the federal mm. government. And that's when the Defense Department came on board. And mm. f f I, I don't have direct knowledge of this, but my sense is at that point, probably someone high up in the chain turned to someone else high up in the chain and said, what can you do about this? And they said, we can build 18 hospitals, and here's the price tag. Mm. And that's how that number came about. Uh, it, it's a very, um, you know, we need to have a different conference about national security and health mm. <laughs> to, to make full sense of that. But mm. that uh, it just extends this interesting set of dialectics that wound up producing something. And I would fully agree that uh, this was not wasted money. This could have been um, put on the ground in ways that were different. Uh, so for example, I'm sure 
you know that, that there were architectural school competitions in the fall of 2014, and, and some of the most innovative um, suggestions were for helicopter liftable, fully contained aluminum treatment units that would be brought to where these little popcorn outcroppings of, of disease were when they were needed instead of centralizing everyone in a way that potentially contributed to propagation of the infection. So That gets back to, Vicky, what you were saying before about these things beginning in the military, the air transportable hospitals and virtually all of these innovations. I, I'd just like to, uh, uh, Gene, if I could, I want to um, push uh, what you were saying uh, a bit because I think there's something really in interesting tie there between that and um, and then um, uh, came what you were saying about the uh, unintended consequences because um, I, when I look at uh, when I look at the history of Im immunology, I mean it's almost as if immunologists have been pushed they've been pushed to conclusions they've been resisting to want to accept. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? <laughs> because the powerful metaphor is the one that came about when microbiology, Salk, Sabin, the rest of them, wiped out embryology. Yeah. We would have had stem cell research 50 years ago if you know, the immunologists hadn't been determined to replace the microbiologists as the heroes of medical practice. Okay, so the warfare thing just kept emerging and emerging and emerging, but, but, but at the same time, they're moved ahead by the, the, this knowledge in such a way so that they actually, uh, are reframing how we think about self and non-self, but they don't even acknowledge that. So it's not as if they're saying, "Oh, we're going to we're going to rethink symbiosis." It's not happening like that. But the but but the knowledge that they've created now this is really interesting to me because if you go back to the late 1960s uh, uh, and then you go back to the 1950s, this idea of of regenerating knowledge or unintended consequences, of course, is what the Macy Foundation was doing. Uh, with um, cybernetics, okay, it had to do with Gregory Bateson and Margaret Mead and Talca Parsons and Norbert Wiener, okay, so that I, in fact, if I had time, I'd show you the slides, a lovely picture of the four of them, you know, with this diagram of cybernetics showing how the cybernetic feedback loop actually creates information that generates a life of its own to get to what mm -hmm. you began your, your, your talk with. So I think, I think that and I'll just say one more thing about this. I think that the things that really haunt me about this are, are first of all, the fact that, that when you look at this historically, I mean, it's pretty obvious, that wonderful list of, of things that you showed that were actually you know, changing history. I mean, history's not moved by knowledge, it's moved by ignorance. I mean, these are all the things we, we, can't, we can't predict the chaos, and it's the chaos that actually moves history, not not our knowledge of it, or the hubris that we have that we actually can control these things. And that's, a, I think, a very humbling thing to, thing to have to acknowledge. And also, when you start to look at it that way, you realize we don't do really well with complexity. I mean, in our diabetes research, we've been looking at, we've been doing uh, some statistical analyses of search engines, right? Um, we know that diabetes is anywhere between 70 and 98 in, in some developing places, 99% mediated by social and cultural risk factors, however they may de be, de be defined. And that it in inversely affects people in poverty going through nutrition transition, I mean, all those sorts of things we know. But if you look, if you go to the search engines and look at Scopus, less than 3% of the literature on diabetes is about complexity or about social sciences or by humanities, it just isn't there. So, so it's not like we're gonna look at the evidence base. We don't have it, and the reason we don't have it, because we're not thinking that way to get to your point about, about you know, the short term and the long term. So I, anyway. Uh, I agree. <laughs> <laughs> There's a question. I think it's interesting to hear more questions. Yeah. 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 So way back there. So I'm going to do a dangerous thing. I'm going to try to pull three disparate thoughts together into a question. Um, and I want to pick up on a couple of things that, were just, that came up. Cybernetics, for one thing, control theory, um, but also this concept of the metaphor and the self and other really uh, pushing up against the sameness issue and in the end being the self and the other being the same. And I come at this from a communications theory point of view, 
we, and so to pick up on the cybernetics thing, I mean, this is essentially I listen to everything that's being said and I hear, oh, signal noise, signal noise, what's the thing? And communication theory, which, you know, in the 50s struggled with this thinking of noise as the other and signal as the self, really came to understand that signal and noise were the same thing. And the only issue was which information is relevant now and which information may be relevant in the future and how much of that future stuff can you do away with but still deal with novel inputs when they come in. So, you know, again, and it's, and it's a very mathematically theoretical and communications theory, you can actually calculate the optimal amount of noise to keep in a system so that it can deal with novel inputs. So going back to Nathaniel's point about that, um, public health doesn't really have an ethics, a theoretical ethics. My, my question, or, 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 or listening to you guys, my response to it is, you know, the ethics of public health really ought to be the calculation of the optimal amount of grimness to deal, to, to allow in the system that provides impetus for resources to be uh, uh, um, uh, motivated to deal with the problem and also leaves enough novel um, uh, uh, chaos out there that can deal with new novel threats and things that we haven't thought of or that, that, that organisms haven't been, been willing or haven't um, uh, evolved yet to deal with. Um, and now I've, thought, I've, heard, I've lost my third point. <laughs> I've lost my third one because I went all the way around in a circle. Um, but I'll leave, I'll leave it at that. I mean, I, I, I don't know. I just, I, I thought there was a, you know, a really interesting thread that went through all of those pieces that comes back. And it's a, it's a place that, uh, uh, again, also in the, uh, to pick up on Rumsfeld's point of the, uh, the, uh, the unknown unknowns, which is what I deal with a lot of the time in the context of national security and, um, uh, and intelligence community. Um, there is a framework for dealing with decision making under uncertainty. I mean, the Kinefin framework, I'm sure that you guys have know about and everything else. Essentially, that is the theoretical framework that you ought to be applying to public health. I'll stop there. Thank you. Um, I, I would agree, <laughs> and I can also assure you that I don't know of anyone who's doing that. Um, outside of what is most likely a, a robust um, intra-military discussion about issues like that. There, there's obviously, as I'm sure you can imagine, uh, a complete bifurcation in terms of what they call force protection, public health, and the rest of public health. And there are um, many locations around the United States, for example, that are devoted to advancing the science of force protection in, in many ways. Um, in in light of all the uncertainty of where U.S. forces and related uh, NATO forces might be deployed. So I, the, the problem with the rest of public health learning from that is that much of it is inaccessible. Um, but I think that there is, um, I, I love this notion of optimal grimness. Uh, I hadn't put those two words together in quite that way <laughs> before. But, um, but I, I think that there is a, you know, there's a reluctance among anyone in public health to, to admit to any grimness at all, uh, aside from grimness as a failure um, of a legitimate effort. And of course, there's been a, a interesting critiques of folks like Paul Farmer, uh, um, who obviously is a champion of um, increasing healthcare availability for everyone in the world, especially those with the least resources. But um, there's been a, a type of critique that I'm only now um, learning about uh, and certainly would love to look into more um, that claims that this is not sufficiently uh, a deep enough dive into the structural impediments to these. This is essentially pasting things over. So lots, lots of issues, uh, but, but I, I really appreciate your comment. And I think that this issue of um, learning about how the military deals with its perhaps a little bit more, you know, white knuckle uh, public health ethics would be interesting because perhaps that's the world in which we're all moving in the future. Sh Sherry Fink has an interesting expose of Paul Farmer uh, 
Paul Farmer's Ebola fiasco in the New York Times that came out about a year and a half ago, which is kind of uh, interesting. Um, I just wanted, I, I think that the, the temporality thing and the, the, the idea that you have to know the future to know what differentiates signal from noise is a very interesting uh, concept that comes back to what Gene said. And uh, I'm now going to be a bit provocative and say what's, what's that th this is all a form of politics, I think, because how can you know the future? And it's all about making the future by, by claiming to know the future. So. This is the equivalent of uh, when when Bush invaded Iraq, the whole neocon thing around reality-based journalism versus, do you remember this thing about we're, we actually don't care what the reality is, we're making reality. And I have to say that the, the Rumsfeld thing, it, it, it uh, you know, that's just a restatement of the jo Johari window. Do you guys know that? I mean, it's 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 funny how it's now credited to him. It's this, it's this four by four thing. It's sort of a self-help thing from the 60s. Uh, about the, this, you, you know, what people think about you, but you don't know what they think. It's mm -hmm. that, it's pop psycho, it's whatever. <laughs> it's just funny to see it reemerge associated with Donald Rumsfeld, and who's you know, architect of the modern age. Hi. Um, one of the things that really struck me was this whole idea of the resistance versus resilience, and how, I guess, Every time that we have the invasive order, it's sort of like leading to change. So I'm just wondering why we tend to fear change so much, because basically that's the whole, everything we don't want to change. So I'm just wondering what your thoughts are on why we resist the change instead of embracing it and seeing where we go from there. It's a wonderful comment. Um, I, I, I would just say one thing, which is that I think a more appropriate metaphor for us in terms of where we, w how we exist in the world is that uh, our playing field is increasingly sloped, imbalanced. We, we you know, as opposed to even generations, decades before, you know, I, I was born in the mid 60s. And if you look at um, any number of metrics, population growth, coral bleaching, you know, you, you name it, uh, that's when things of course, I'm biased because this is my lifetime. That's when things started to go bad, just when I was born. Um, uh, but, but, but really, it, you know, we, we, everything, this is like a, a trope from a bad movie, everything is accelerating. Mm -hmm. and, and not recognizing that is something that policymakers do at their peril, especially in a setting as fluid as we now see with something like Zika, which didn't exist when this conference was being organized uh, as, a, as a public health threat, uh, we are just gonna see more of these and they're going to hit us in different ways and um, this, this definitely does require a new set of balancing skills. The problem as I see it from inside Washington and down in CDC and on the international scene is that um, it's a very, slow moving ship and I think that change like that will come slowly and with difficulty if at all. Sure, um, I, I, I'd like to add to that. It's a very, um, very uh, nice um, response. Um, I think the only thing I'd like to add is that the part of the reason that risks are risks is that most of the time they don't work, you know, so. That is to say that if we think that, take it, we call them calculated risks, but by and large, um, you know, um, people are conditioned, as it were, to follow. I mean, I, you, know, we, you and I are doing this. We're making a contract, and we do this thousands of times in any given day. I mean, we follow one another. I don't mean that in a negative sense, but I think that, that biologically that's how we, how we get by, and we assume that we have some kind of uh, collective agreement. So people who don't or can't follow, who are defective followers, who actually take chances, realize right away. I mean, you, you know, you, I have a close friend who's a neuropsychologist who studies this, and he says that, you know, the funny thing is that you can, you, you can, you can look at the, the homeless person and, you know, Einstein in his bedroom slippers and say, you know, that there's some parallel in terms of these people not fitting in, but the, the difference between, 
the person who actually takes the risk and does something different that has an impact, the a very unusual person, that's the first point, and the homeless person is that is the, is the, the person who has that impact realizes when they become vulnerable that they need to recruit allies pretty quickly. That is to say that, 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 that risk is a pretty difficult place to be. And I think that, that, that what's really, for me, humbling about thinking about something like the immune system as a search engine is that it suggests to us that we're, we need to take these risks all the time in order to be symbiotically engaged with our, our environment. And some of these actually are quite potentially dangerous, but most of them aren't. You know, we, we're, 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 our, 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 our immune systems are, you know, these are mutation transformation factories that are processing information all the time, and most of it doesn't, doesn't necessarily have a negative impact on uh, upon us, but the but the risk part of it, I think, is really, um, yeah, I think that it's a it's a it, it's a it's the big one because evolution can't answer that. You know, you have no idea whether a risk is conditioning or it makes you look like the non-survivor until after it's over. Then you tell that nice little story about how you were conditioned to survive. You know. Uh, writing a bit about FDR and rehabilitation as a sentimental answer uh, in the world of uh, infantile paralysis, polio, et cetera. Immigration as American values as a, uh, uh, the same thing, rehabilitating these immigrants who come in and they find this thing. Uh, prison, using baseball, using uh, arts and crafts, using uh, literary, uh, educational, you know, uh, projections into a rehabilitation world. Again, all sentimental, uh, all humanitarian. Uh, the truth, perhaps partially, is that rehabilitation is not a good mode, is not a good model, is not a good answer, is not a good frame of thinking for, uh, whether it's complexities or uh, just stubborn realities that exist that need other kinds of models, other kinds of thinking. I think that's part of where the situation uh, we're, we're facing right now is. It's an old throwback from the New Deal, in other words. Are there any other questions? We can tag them on. Thank you very much, both uh, panels, for this inspiring conversations. You know, I've been thinking through those several hours about the concept of border, because if we talk about invasion, we should understand what we mean by border. And in this sort of borderless world that is promoted heavily nowadays, uh, and with internet and uh, infrastructure and everything, uh, we still have this issue of a border in Europe and uh, uh, especially physical border in terms of viruses and uh, viruses invading us and invading um, our nations. Maybe if you could um, speak a bit to the concept of border in the modern world, like how we can, uh, have, has it changed since, um, th through these years, through the generations, or do we still uh, have to have this type of a border in terms of nations and peoples and, and similar things. Thank you. Thank you. Who wants to go second? No, no. I would I would defer to the the first panel <laughs> for that. Um, I, in terms of uh, public health and medicine. Um, I think um, Zika and other viral diseases like that um, uh, continue to surprise us with how they, they break down our internal borders. I mean, talk about a microbiological wonder. Th this is how Ebola captures and resynthesizes 
quote unquote border proteins from the human body to uh, camouflage itself essentially uh, against uh, detection by um, certain types of immune uh, mechanisms. So it, this is, you know, I, I think one way to think about borders is in terms of vulnerability, the vulnerability they pose, the, the um, in terms of political borders, the amount of uh, stature that we give them in terms of keeping us protected from a biological perspective, the ability of protections that have evolved uh, in both humans and animals to provide protection and the ways that they can be subverted. Uh, every time we put up a wall, that wall will have some vulnerability and the risk is that something will exploit that vulnerability. Biology is at its finest and most devious when it does that and it does it all the time. Um, I just want to add one other comment here. Oh, I'm sorry, did you want to? No, you can respond to both. I'm just saying that there, there were two okay. questions up there. Um, yeah, I, uh, the FDR uh, question, I don't have a response to that. I, I um, yeah, have a personal experience, but I, we can talk <laughs> about that, that afterwards. Um, uh, but I would like to say something about the border issue because I think you raised a really important point about the borderless world as it relates to um, national invasions and that invasive ideology. And I'd like to tie that back to what you were saying before, Gene, about auto autoimmunity, because there's a really haunting, um, uh, in Silverstein's history of, of, of immunology, there's a really haunting um, diagram where he shows um, what's called the dark ages of autoimmunity. And the dark ages of autoimmunity, the times historically when there was very little research on autoimmunity. And those times were actually the times of war, okay? Which, which reminded me, and I, I guess if I had time, I would have talked more about it, of another thing that Nietzsche once said, which is in times of peace, the warlike man attacks himself. And you know, I, I, I can't help but think that at, at some level that, that, that here you have a, a really interesting example of how metaphors, powerful, deep-seated metaphors, call them what you will, how they, how they have the capacity actually to create history where knowledge actually creates its own future to get to the, to the information theory idea. Uh, just a, a detailed question. The um, increase in plastic and the Zika, uh, that's a correlation, a causal? What's, what's going on there? Um, I think it's difficult to describe it in terms of either correlation or a causal relationship. But what I can tell you is that one of the things that the Brazilian army is doing is it's going systematically through the favelas and the countryside, um, putting chemicals in buckets. Uh, you know, many of the folks who have open water containers in their backyards that do so because they don't have running water. So it, it's not as though these are left on a whim, um, but there is a recognition based on the understanding of the biology of the, the vector, the Aedes mosquito, that any, even a spoonful, any open water uh, potentially is a breeding ground for this type of mosquito. So uh, there is enough of a sense that there is a causal relationship that in addition to the fumigation, there is an effort both to cover all of these water containers um, and also to eliminate those that aren't absolutely necessary. Uh, I, you know, I'm sure you've seen the mostly hilarious websites of spurious causal correlations uh, between things like, you know, things happening in movies and external events in the political world, uh, you know, y you can draw graphs of the number of <laughs> uh, tires in the world and the number of cases of dengue, uh, which are carried by mosquitoes that happen to love living in tires because tires provide the perfect breeding ground for these mosquitoes. In fact, there's a Canadian scientist who's now created a mosquito trap 
using tires, which is a brilliant subversion of that uh, association. So um, I'm sure one could, in a controlled fashion, define the causal relationship. Personally, I don't think it's necessary. I think that the association is reasonable enough and has been seen across the globe enough to um, support what the basic entomology suggests would occur. Any more I don't know if that answers your question. You seem skeptical. <laughs> <laughs> What is the suggestion that the increase in plastic is directly leading to more breeding grounds more breeding grounds right? for the Aedes aegypti and for the Aedes albopictus? Yes, that's correct. But I, I had heard also there was something about increased trade and recycled uh, sure. uh, what do you call them no. tires, tires yes. from French because how how did that mosquito get from French Polynesia to Brazil? Mm. Sure. It's kind of I mean, they, they, they don't fly more than about 100 yards, yeah. 100 meters in any direction. So they had to be transported. Mm. Yep. Are there any more questions? Anything else you guys want to say, ask each other? Thank you very much. Yes, thank <laughs> you for your <laughs> patience forbearance. and your, yes. your forbearance with us. Thank you so much, and we start again tomorrow at noon with an ideas panel and then one on ecologies. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you.